God say thank you, Jesus. Let the people of God say hallelujah. Let's stand before this sacred desk and claim the scripture. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. To Pastor, the church, First Lady of the Church, and to the members of the Baptist Church of Wimbledon, and distinguished guests, glad to be in your presence and allow to share a word from the Lord. And this occasion is even much, should be even more celebrated, uh, along with having one of the most baddest parts of Columbia, South Carolina. Let the church say amen. Glad to have the Ephesus Mass Choir with me. Have the microphone just a little Glad to have the Ephesus Choir with me here. And I see my family in the back just waiting to me. I just want to see you in the Ephesus family. Y'all look at me. around like you know who you are. I praise God for you. I praise God for uh, my wife. May the church say amen. Uh, we're celebrating 10 years in August. Amen. And, and of course, I have my youngest son there, Zachary Keith Woodard. Um, he is uh, one year old, and I'm glad to have my oldest celebrating a birthday today, um, Ethan Thierry Woodard. Uh, he is seven years old and passed, and we just seen happy birthday. Well, where's the person? In fact, he's going to stand for us. Everybody see him? Okay. I want to say, we go ahead and see you guys. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Davis, um, back in, was it 1997, um, that's when we had the Eastern District Federation, which was going on. Um, Sister Sparks Davis uh, was president, I was vice president, and we worked hard that year to organize a program to be glory of God. Is that all right? Uh, praise God for his servant, Pastor Davis, being here. He's been learning a lot around the world this time. And I've shown Pastor Davis here, you are a living testimony. Amen. And you would not be here if it wasn't for the power of God and the praying wife. So we celebrate the woman of God today, man, who's been my pastor's gift. Sister Davis, a round of applause as well, man. Amen. 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 Now, personally, preacher, we've been praying for you. You are a brother to me. And my heart went out to you when you were in the hospital. But when I heard you preach, and I heard that voice come back, I said, he's back. And you can't keep a preacher back. So I praise God for you. Well, there is a word from the Lord that I would like to share with the people of God today. I firmly believe that the devil does not want me to share this based on the events that transpired, transpired this week. Uh, but that's all right. That's all right. Um, I'm not going to allow the rocks to cry out in my place. I will share God's word and what he has for us. If you can turn with me to Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 48. Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 48. And when you found that particular passage, let us stand and honor God's word this morning. Bible says in Luke chapter 2, verse 48. Starting with verse 47. And all who heard him 
were astonished. They were amazed at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, my son, why have you done this to us? Why have you treated us this way? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And Jesus said to his parents, Why did you seek? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. This morning, Ephesus family, church family, I have entitled this morning's message, Woke. Woke. Now I want you to remember this one statement. If you forget anything I'm going to say this morning, is that once you realize, once your life's mission is revealed, it will cause contention, confusion, and a change of location. Once your life's mission is disclosed, it will cause contention, conflict. It will cause confusion. And it will require a change of location. Father God, Lord, we call upon your holy name because, Father, there is no other name to call. Therefore, Father, as I share the word that you have downloaded in my spirit, I pray, Father God, that most of all, your name will be glorified. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Let the church say, Amen, Amen, Amen. You may be seated here in the presence of the Lord. We have all been inside this storm. Whenever it opens in the community, near grocery stores or small businesses, they are mostly affected by its presence. Its location can be found all over the nation. 37 million people shop there per day, which statistically is larger than the population of Canada. It brings in $1.8 million in profit every hour. The family that envisioned this franchise is worth $152 billion, as much as Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and Michael Bloomberg combined. 90% of Americans live 15 minutes from it. And in my opinion, it is known for having over 20 registers, but yet three are open at any given time. It's none other than Walmart. However, what makes Walmart so remarkable, Pastor, is not necessarily the profits the driving distance, or the myriad locations, but it has inside its store a wall dedicated to missing children. Walmart works with what we call the Missing Children's Network. The CEO, uh, Ernie Allen, says, quote, nearly 7,000 children have been featured on Walmart bulletin boards. And 5,300 of whom have been recovered. He says further, we know that 134 children were recovered after callers calling a certain number specifically stating they recognized a child's photo in Walmart. I believe that if Walmart, that is the same with me, existed in week two, that Mary and Joseph would pass in Jesus' face all over the wall. You would see a Jewish boy from Nazareth, long hair, discolored eyes, was seen last at the Passover. The boy Jesus, stay with me, is apparently lost. Or is he really lost? If you can say with me, Jesus and his family, Ephesus, is traveling to Jerusalem. This trip is not a trip that is unorthodox or a new trip. It's a trip that is taken every single year. The first trip is revealed in verses 22 to 40. 
Jesus is apparently a baby at this time going to be presented before the Lord. The Bible says there are two people who recognize the Savior, and these two people come and say, this has to be the Son of God. The irony of this situation is that thousands travel back and forth, but only two recognize the Lamb of God. That's why in John 1, 29, John the Baptist had to really point out and say with clear tones, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The baby Jesus has now been dedicated to the Lord, and for at least years his parents have gone again and again to Jerusalem celebrating the Passover. For the Bible says in Luke 2.41, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem to the festival of the Passover. Stay with me. This festival, once again, was a seven-day celebration of how God delivered their ancestors from Egyptian bondage. And according to Exodus chapter 12, the night the angel of death passed came into Egypt, the people of God were required to slaughter at twilight. They were required to eat unleavened bread, fully dressed, showing and signifying a quick departure from Egypt. The blood of the animal was placed on the doorpost that the angel of crucifixion would pass by. This event was a mark as the beginning of a new month and a new year. In each year, the Jews celebrated this event for seven days in Jerusalem. Now, understand the context. Jesus in scripture is 12 years old, am I right? And according to Jewish custom, the 12th year was the dividing line between childhood and adulthood. The Bible of Ages, chapter 8, says this quote, For the first time, the child Jesus lived upon the temple. He saw the white robed priest performing the solemn ministry. He beheld the victim at the altar of sacrifice. He beheld the worshipers bow in prayer. He beheld the impressive rites of the service. And day by day, for seven days, the boy Jesus saw clearer his life purpose. And every act, Sister White says, seemed to be bound up in his own life. Therefore, as he saw that lamb being sacrificed, new impulses were awakening within him. Silent and absorbed, he seemed to be studying out a great problem. Sister White says that the mystery of his mission was revealed at 12 years old. Here at the festival, the boy Jesus is giving a full revelation of his life's work. The Bible says he was born to die that I might live. He was to die on a proverbial altar for the world, for a world that you cannot. For in this revelation echoed John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Here we have, stay with me, this 12-year-old boy, he now knows his ministry. He now knows his call. His mission, chaplain, is clearer than ever before. However, we have forgotten one thing. That once your life's mission is revealed, it will cause tension, confusion, and require a change of location. In verses 43 to 44, something interesting is happening as Jesus' parents go back home. As Mary and Joseph are traveling back from Jerusalem, they are aware that Jesus is not with them spatial distance. Therefore, hear this, they assume in the scripture that he is traveling somewhere in the back with relatives and friends. The Bible says because of this assumption, they travel at least one day or 24 hours before they even initiated initiating finding Jesus. Say with me. Watch this. Their assumption, which was false, gave them a false sense of peace. This false sense of peace kept them moving away from Jerusalem for at least 24 hours. They felt that they that finding him was not a priority because they assumed that they knew where he was located. And in truth be told, some of us have the same procrastinating mentality. We fear that Jesus. 
Jesus will always be there and always be available when we get ready. And this, my dear friend, is a lie. Because if you don't believe it's a lie, once you have a conversation with Samson, he was the strongest, but yet the weakest morally. Believe that any time he could fight his way to Philistine, but yet when he confessed his secrets to God, God had left him. This assumption that we have, this familiarity with God that we have, causes us to procrastinate and find God for ourselves. We have heard this statement before, familiarity brings content. Understand something, it is, it is a danger to become too familiar with holy things. Some of us are so familiar with our health and our body, we take advantage of our health. Some of us are familiar and with our spouse, we take advantage of them. Some of us are familiar with our family and friends, no longer are they a priority. And understand, sometimes you can be so caught up in doing things for God that you become too familiar with God. To, to the point where you begin to find that He's not even there. So after 24 hours, hear this. When Jesus' parents realized that they were missing, they began to look for Jesus among family and friends. I have a problem with this, Pastor. Our uncles and close family friends who Mary said they had not seen Jesus among themselves. I have one problem that I have is not Mary and Joseph searching for Jesus. My problem is, is that they were searching for Jesus among the crowd. Jesus in his ministry had great crowds to follow him, but never did he follow the crowd. And never think you can find Jesus in the crowd. The same crowd that packed you on the back is the same crowd that sat you in the back. The Bible says narrow is the way, but the broad or the crowd goes the other way. The crowd that cried Hosanna is the same crowd that cried crucify him. The crowd that said and that cried at Master's funeral is the same crowd that said, Give me Barabbas. If you are looking for Jesus, that was this, you will never find him in the crowd. When Jesus started his ministry, Pastor, he did not ordain a crowd, but he ordained twelve. And among that twelve, he had three close. And among that three, he had a one favorite named John the Beloved. Jesus can't be found in the crowd. And if you reflect upon your life, think about all the crowds you've been in, and you were still alone. Think about some of the crowds you've been in, and you were still afraid. Think about all the crowds you've been in, and you still felt out of place. Peace cannot be found in the crowd. Joy cannot be found in the crowd. Love cannot be found in the crowd. Jesus cannot be found in the crowd. So when Mary and Joseph, here it is, realize that they are looking for Jesus in all the wrong places, they at that moment decide to go back where they first saw him. The Bible continues, so Jesus' parents got back to Jerusalem. I want you to imagine this now. They've been missing their child for over 25 hours. And I can imagine, maybe you never had a child missing, but you can imagine, family, the level of emotion that is in the parent's mind. Perhaps when they are frantic, they are worried, they are upset at themselves, choir, they have lost Jesus. And for three days, they search homes and they search houses. They posted Jesus' face on a cover of milk cartons. They sent anger alerts to all throughout Jerusalem. They told the local authorities about their child Jesus. And those three days when they couldn't find Jesus, I can imagine the conversation between these two parents. Joseph, I told you to keep an eye on him. Mary, you said that he was with you. But based on outward appearance, Mary and Joseph at this moment are losing the parenting battle. So you can imagine for three days. They're trying to remain normal. For three days, they're trying to maintain their composure. That's what happens when you lose, lose Jesus for one hour. It will take three days to find him. Have you ever noticed that when you lack the emotional life, lack the connection, or you skip something through your day, it takes you even longer to, to connect? One minute without Jesus, you lost three days of peace. 
to have this moment past it. The parents are walking around with three eggs. Joseph is mad at himself. Mary is scratching his head, catching her hand, and all of a sudden, the Bible says there's a little voice coming from the temple that sounds just like you, Jesus. The Bible says, in verse 26, once again, after three days they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw them, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I, once again, have been searching for three days. We have your name packed all over the wall. Amber Alert is showing your face. Now I want you to know who Jesus is. Why are we searching for him? Now, the truth is, it appears, Ephesus, that Jesus could have had a little stop now. Because if I've been hustling so long to find you, and the first remark that comes from my son is, why are you finding him? Why are you searching for him? At that moment, truth be told, the flesh is going to rise in me. Looking back at the level of energy, I had to put in the fire Mary is probably saying to herself, after the hell you have put us through, you have the nerve to say, why were we searching for? And then to add added to insult, you are going to say that you should have known, we should have known where you at. What was my Savior talking about? Let's break this down. I want you to stick with me. The phrase, why were you searching for? Implies, Pastor, that Mary didn't have to search. The phrase also implies that the people, the only time you search for somebody is when they're listening. Say with me. Say with me. The phrase, did you not know that I would be in my father's house, reveals that Mary did not fully understand the mission that Jesus was on. Luke 2.19 says that Mary treasured up all these things and pondered it in her hearts. The phrase, say with me, why were you searching for me? It's also looking in the context, it's pretty clear. If Jesus' parents would have not looked for him, Jesus probably would have stayed there a little longer. Stay with me. The reason why Jesus stayed there is not because he was lost, but because he was woke. Stay with me. He was woke about that he was the lamb of the castle. He was woke about that he was the unleavened bread. He was told about that his blood is a one that should be put up on the doorpost. And because of this revelation of his mission, it's now causing conflict, confusion, and requires a change of location. Raise your hand if you want to use law. Say with me. Mary, hear this. Mary searching for Jesus was not searching for a lost child. He was, she was searching for Jesus in the context of his mission. Mary searching for Jesus was not for a lost child, but it was a result of Jesus recognizing who he is. Because when you find out what God has in your life, most people will be uncomfortable. Talk to me now. Mary said, I went there with Jesus. She expected to come back with Jesus. He is my son. I expected him to be by my side. There are expectations I have for them. But now that Jesus is realizing who he is, he is now in conflict with his mother's expectation. And because she doesn't fully understand the mission, she is frantically looking for a supposed lost child. 
when we bring it home, your call and mission in life will inevitably cause conflict with people who don't understand. And what they deem arrogant, foolish, and ignorant, you see as a blessing, an opportunity, and God's will. Talk to me now. And since they don't understand, they want you to stay right there doing the same old thing. But I say today, you cannot do it when you have a full revelation of God. And when you have that revelation of God, the world will say you are foolish of all that revelation. It was foolish for Noah to preach 120 years. I'm talking about rain that's coming down they never seen rain before. It was foolish for Abraham and Sarah, Sarah way after menopause, Abraham over 100 years old, talking about I have a child at my own age. It was foolish for these three people boys who have been exalted, given prestige and honor in the camp of Nebuchadnezzar. They should have bowed down. It was foolish, but when you have a revelation of God, people will not understand your actions. Has anybody ever had a revelation? And what happens is, when you begin to have a revelation, it causes conflict in somebody else's life. Talk to me now. The Bible says, now that he has now that he understands the revelation of his life, it is now causing conflict with his mother's expectation. Follow me now. It is causing conflict because he now knows who he is. Stay with me. Here it is. It causes conflict with his family. It also causes conflict in the church. The Bible says that when they saw Jesus, they were sitting in the midst. They were sitting in the midst. Here it is. He was not giving a speech, but listening and asking questions. The Bible says they were astonished and amazed by his answer. And at the same that time, they were confused. They were confused, chapter, not by the answer. They were confused because he doesn't look like what he's called to do. Oh, you can't believe this. Bible angel says that in this visit to Jerusalem, the parents of Jesus wished to pray with him in connection with the great teachers of Israel. While he was obedient in every particular to the word of God, they hoped that he would revere the learned rabbi. But here is this 12 year old boy. The Bible says he's 12, he's from Nazareth. He's unlearned, therefore because of his age, because of his residence, because of his educational background, because of his financial status and political affiliation, because of his years in ministry, because of that, because he's not been a member in our church very long, because of the color of his skin and his diet, because of what he's associated, he doesn't look like what he's called to do. Uh, let me bring it personal. I'm glad to have a doctor who worked hard for it. But one thing I had to battle was myself. And also those who didn't believe. Very true story. Those that I was pastor here, I was coming to this particular pastor. Just come to him as old pastor. And I said, you know what? I'm working my, I'm working my deep in. I'm working hard. I'm glad to be doing it. And he looks at me, Pastor Davis, and says, you don't even look like a doctor. I said, that makes but then I began to think about that David didn't look like a king. Noah didn't look like a preacher. Elijah didn't look like a prophet. Moses didn't look like, look like an abolitionist. Paul didn't look like an evangelist. Peter didn't look like a savior. And Jesus didn't look like an evangelist. And Jesus didn't look like a savior. Because a man looks at the outward appearance and God looks at the heart. When you begin what God has called you to do, you don't look like it. But he calls those things 
So at this moment, Pastor, the leaders are very confused. His family is confused. It's now causing conflict. He appeared lost, but he really knows who he is. People are amazed because he doesn't look like a savior. He's a boy, he's 12 years old. He can any good thing and come out of Nazareth. But here it is. Once you have a revelation of your life's mission, not only does it cause conflict, not only does it cause confusion, but it also requires a change of location. The text says, did you not know that I will be in my father's house? Some translations chapter says, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But I can go into the original choir, it says, did you not know that it was necessary for me to be in that house of my father? Because a revelation of Christ's mission causes conflict, it causes confusion, and it requires a change of location. I often ask this, this question in the text. Why does it say, chapter? it is necessary for me to be in the house of my father? Understand, when Jesus saw the Passover and realized that he was the Lamb of God and that he would take away the sins of the world, and that he was and is and will always be the Son of God. What more will a son want than to be in the house of his father? That's why in John 14, Thomas says, Permit us to see the Father. But Jesus says, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. If I want to find out who Jesus is, I have to go to his father's house. If I wanted a lawyer, I would go to the courtroom. If I wanted to see a doctor, I would go to the hospital. If I wanted to to a counselor, I would go to a counselor office. If I wanted to see a pastor, I would go to a church. If I wanted to see a president, I would go to the White House. If I want to see Jesus, I have to go to my father's house. You can't find Jesus in the crowd. Nor can you find him in position and relationship and career. If I want to find Jesus, I got to go to my father's house. And in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, it would have told you. I hear Jesus saying, excuse me, mother. Excuse me, father. I don't need to be rude and impolite. I can no longer position myself next to you. I need to relocate myself to my father's house. And that relocation became a reality when he ascended to his father and my father. That location became a reality when he moved from the holy place to the most holy place. That position became a reality. It will become all reality when he says, he that is just, let be just him. He that is filthy, and on that day, that corruptible must relocate to the corruption. This mortal must relocate into immortality. And then what's going to happen? We're going to relocate from this planet to my father's house. Let my 
cross, Mary was the one who was lost. Who had peace? Jesus and Mary. Who was really lost? And Mary, the mother of Jesus. Is that something? I want to share this with you every day. God has a call and a mission in your life. And you are the only person who is designed to do it. It doesn't have to age you. Your call is not defined by your career. It's not defined by your position in church. But what happens is when you find out what it is, it will cause confusion. It's going to cause chaos. And sometimes you're going to have to relocate from people who don't understand who you are. That's what's going on in the text. Jesus now knows who he is. The question I have today is that do you know who you are? Are you about your father's business? His eyes, his eyes, both. I really want you to ask this question. Am I about my father's business? Or do I desire to simply be by my mother's side and content with the Lord? No. When God gives you a revelation, you must follow it all the way. No matter what people say, what people do, no matter who cuts you off, you have to follow all of it. Abraham could not be a father of many nations if he wouldn't stay at his father's house. And Jesus would never, never became a perfect savior if he wouldn't stay saved by his mother's side. If you're a person that says, Father, I'm ready. I'm ready now to follow you all the way. I'm not worried about the conflict because there's nothing too hard for you. I'm not worried about how I look because it ain't all about looks. It's about what God is able to do through you. And if I have to relocate, change my purpose and change my agenda, change my mind, relocate my thoughts and be about God's business. If that's your desire, I want you to stand with me. By saying, you're saying, Lord, I am woke to my mission and purpose, and I'm ready to fulfill this according to your will. If that is your desire, I just want you to stand with me. You're saying, saying, Lord, I'm ready. Please do not stand if you don't believe it. As seven day of business, I want you to remember this. The Bible says we have a great act the message to go to work. And this message is not just to be presented by pastors and elders and those who go to seminary. The Bible says the evangelists are those who sit in our churches. I want to share with you, if you want to know what your mission is, your mission is to preach and to share the gospel with new apologies. So I said a Christian's model ought to be for God I live, for God I live. Do you know what that means when you say that? You're saying, Lord, I'm going to leave it all on the altar. You're going to take care of this. That's what it means. We go a little farther here. It'll be hard to fulfill the mission for Christ and do God's will if you have not given your heart to it. If you understand that, right? God says, Listen, I want to use you, but in the end, I want to save you. So, if you're a person right now that knows in your personal life that you have not fully given your heart to Christ, if you're a person, if you're aware of this, that there are some things in your life that does not line up with God, just because it doesn't matter what you've done. The world will love you um, as long as you agree with it. But God says, I love you unconditionally. That's the power of the gospel. It doesn't matter what you have done. Pay the murderer. 
may be seated for a moment of silence and meditation. Please follow the instruction of our ushers, and please remember, lunch is for everybody. Amen. <laughs> 